So I would like to call on stage Leonard Graver, a partner at Greenberg LLP, a corporate and litigation boutique with offices in Los Angeles and Palo Alto. Leonard represents startup companies and venture capital funds in a wide variety uh, of technologies. His practice ranges from the formation of new startup companies through venture capital financings, M&A technology and licensing transactions. Uh, he rep also represented uh, uh, venture capital funds in matters ranging from fund formation to investment structuring. Uh, Leonard writes and lectures frequently on private equity, corporate and technology licensing issues. Oleg Stolar, senior counsel at Akin Gump, has broad experience in representing both plaintiffs and defendants in all aspects of civil litigation in state court, federal court, and arbitrations from pre filing through trial and appeal. Throughout his practice, Oleg uh, has represented multiple Fortune 500 companies as well as a major foreign government and has litigated cases involving a broad range of legal issues. He's also contributing uh, author of California Business Litigation, a two-volume attorney's handbook published by California Continuing Education of the Bar. And our moderator is, oh, hi, Eric Gambrell, a partner of Ekin Gump. Uh, he represents businesses and high net worth individuals in uh, breach of fiduciary duty, fraud litigation, and commercial matters. Eric is a courtroom lawyer. Be careful. He regularly appears for trials, hearings, and depositions in both state and federal courts and arbitration. Welcome on stage. I'm going to first introduce my uh, partner, Eddie Woods, to give a, a couple of, of remarks. Uh, hi, thank you all for staying around for a, a presentation that hopefully will be interesting and certainly will be slightly different than what you've heard so far. Um, I've had the privilege over the past uh, almost two days to listen to some incredibly brilliant entrepreneurs and financial investors. And the objective, as best I can take away, is for everyone to try and make as much money as possible and at the same time come up with some creative and valuable services and products. Along the way, one can run into innumerable problems. This panel that has already been introduced to you will discuss some of what we call the landmines. And the important thing to think about is well before you've hopefully succeeded and made all that money, you better pay attention to the problems that might arise before you end up losing all of it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very quick. We're going to get to the landmines, uh, which we think are important, whether you are a uh, an investor, uh, a fund, uh, you are the founder, director, shareholder, uh, navigating your way through fiduciary duty issues, these legal issues, is vital to the success of, of your business uh, and vital to whether you will ultimately have huge and expensive and distracting legal problems. Um, what we want to do is not lull you into some sense of security because it's not there. We want to jar you, we want to get your attention and understand, at least on a, uh, a, 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 a kind of a mid-altitude level, some of the issues that we've experienced in both representing, of all kinds, uh, uh, founders, funds, directors, shareholders, what are the traps they get into and how can we early on be thinking about these issues to try to avoid, uh, avoid that. Um, so with that, why don't we go to landmine number one. Am I a fiduciary and I don't even know it? The first question everybody in here wants to know is, in whatever capacity they're in, are they a fiduciary? Are they going to owe more duties uh, than under the law uh, than an arm's length relationship? So Alex, uh, tell us uh, about your experiences or tell us about uh, what it takes to be a fiduciary. Sure. So. What makes someone a fiduciary? Fiduciary is someone who has a legal or ethical relationship of trust with someone else. And that relationship is what creates the additional legal obligations. And by the way, ignorance is no excuse. So you owe those obligations whether you know you're a fiduciary or not. 
And so an easy example of fiduciary is a trustee, right? Trustee owes a relationship of trust to the beneficiary. Another obvious example are directors, officers, majority shareholders. They owe fiduciary duties to their company and to the minority shareholders, for example. And so how can you tell when that relationship begins? So no formal agreement is necessary. The relationship can begin with a handshake. It can begin through the course of an ordinary conversation where you're simply sort of sharing your experiences and your advice. Uh, so you may not even realize it, but the other person may consider the relationship formed. And so it's an issue that comes up again and again and again. And again, I cannot stress this enough. So no formal agreement is necessary to make you a fiduciary. It's just a fact-specific analysis of the nature of your relationship to someone else. We've got a lot of landmines and not a lot of time, so we're going to go to the second landmine. Uh, and Leonard, uh, common mistakes that you've seen in your experience, both as an investor but also as a lawyer advising clients on common mistakes made by startup founders. What have you, what, what's, what's out there? Okay, guys, uh, the most important, in my opinion, the most important thing in documenting relationship among startup founders is vesting, 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 vesting. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'm uh, working with a startup, four founders. Each one has 25% of the company. Um, working on the project, a year later, one of the founders got a job at Facebook, got a half a million dollar signing bonus, and says, bye-bye, I'm off to Facebook. So what happens? The other three remaining founders are toiling for the company, while the fourth founder still has 25% of the company, but he's not contributing. And that's not good. So they need to hire somebody else. They have to issue more shares, be diluted. And that person is enjoying the fruits but not contributing. So that's a big, big problem. So vesting is very, very important. Founders should not get shares outright. All the shares have to be subject to vesting. One other point, one other point. Sounds great, doesn't it? But there are potential dangers here. I'll give you another example. So I've got a client, um, he is a very smart, just a brilliant professor, computer science professor. So he, his fiance and his PhD student decided to open a company. Open the company, each one gets one third of the shares, but those shares are now subject to vesting. So if anyone leaves the company, was fired within one, the first year, they don't get any shares, they lose all their shares. So one day, the professor comes home, and guess who he sees in his bedroom? He sees fiancé and his PhD student, you know, having sex. So he's upset. He's upset, and he, the next day, he fires the PhD student. So what do you think the PhD student and the fiancé do? They fire the professor. He was the CEO of the company. He is fired because they got two-thirds of the votes, and he's got one-third. A year, about nine months later, the company sold to a big player in the Valley for 18 million bucks. So the professor, not only did, does he lose his fiance, he lost six million bucks, and now he's got problems with the university because the PhD student is complaining that he's being discriminated against. So vesting is important, but you gotta make sure how you structure it. All right, let's go to the next uh, landmine number three. That was, that was helpful and interesting. Landmine number three. <laughs> Uh, we've talked a little bit about, do you have a fiduciary duty? Let's assume you do. Now let's get, let's get into what are those fiduciary duties? Uh, what are the accretive fiduciary duties from an arm's length relationship? Alex, what are your thoughts so, on that? There are three main categories of fiduciary duties. There is the duty of care, the duty of loyalty, and the duty of disclosure. And you can think of each one of those fiduciary duties as a line in the sand. And if you cross that line, you may be held liable for a breach. And here's why lawyers love breach of fiduciary duty claims. And I mean plaintiff's lawyers and plaintiffs, because they allow for punitive damages. So if you, for example, are a founder and you have an agreement with an investor, say that the investor owes you $10 million, and there is a breach, on the usual breach of contract claim, all you can recover is that $10 million. Now, if there is a breach of fiduciary duty claim, you can have punitive damages, and they can be a multiple of that 10 million, which is why plaintiffs love it, 
and investors and founders need to be aware of them. Alex, that's important, but you're not saying these are the only three duties. These are three primary duties as these fiduciary, are the correct? Three these are the three primary categories of duties. And as you can imagine, each category has a number of variations within them. Let's talk about the first one, the duty of care. What is the duty of care? So you can think of the duty of care in a very simple way. It's basically a duty to investigate. It's a duty to make yourself informed of all relevant material facts before making a decision. Um. Do you have any, uh, any, any examples, like a duty to investigate, is that incorporated in the duty of care? It is, right? It's part of the duty of care. And a good example is, let's say you're selling your company. And if you're the majority shareholder or the CEO or a director, you may have a duty of care to investigate who you're selling it to. Because if you don't, and the sale goes through, and the buyer later on loots the company, or otherwise drives it into the ground, you may be liable for breach of duty of care to the remaining shareholders for not having conducted that investigation. Let me give you an example, Alex. We'd like your thoughts on it. Founder Gene owns the majority interest in a company. He tells his investors he needs another round of capital to pay data influencers to market his product, which he expects will boost sales. How could that get him into trouble? What are, what are some things he ought to watch out for? Well, that's another common example that comes up in breach of duty of care claims. And that's an example of a careless statement, right? So let's say the founder makes this representation and he obtains the capital he's looking for, but then what he expects to happen does not happen, right? Company sales do not go up. Well, the investors are going to start asking some hard questions. And one of those questions will be, well, what did you base that representation on? Did you do your due diligence? Did you do your research? And if the founder does not have any hard data to show that he did do his due diligence, he may be facing a breach of duty of care claim. Uh, just just quick interruption. Uh, so one advice, uh, put as little as you can in writing. <laughs> That's helpful. If you're making any representations, yeah, just talk on the phone, Skype, don't put it in writing. <laughs> That's helpful. Alex, let's talk about the second duty. Let's move on to duty of loyalty. Um, tell us about the duty of loyalty as a fiduciary duty. Well, the duty of loyalty basically means you have to put the interests of your principal ahead of your own interests. And this means no self-interested transactions. And if you are contemplating a self-interested transaction where you personally stand to benefit, then you should definitely try to at least protect yourself by obtaining the fully informed consent of your principal before entering into that transaction. In writing. In writing. In an yes. agreement. This, this is the contrary of what you just heard. That, that kind of consent you do want to have in writing, so there's no confusion later on. With full disclosure. Fully informed, right. So what does fully informed mean? Fully informed means that that consent is only valid if you disclosed all relevant material facts to your principal. Otherwise, he's going to challenge that consent as invalid. Well, let's talk about uh, uh, the duty of loyalty uh, and give you a quick example, Alex. Mike sits on the board of directors in Startup 1. He learns of an investment opportunity in start, Startup 2, a direct competitor of Startup 1. Tell me about what things he ought to look out for before he uh, takes his next step. Well. That's a classical example of a potential breach of duty of loyalty because if Mike acts on that investment opportunity, he's creating a clear conflict of interest. He'd be benefiting at the expense of his company and he would most likely be facing a claim for breach of duty of loyalty. And just want to add quickly to that, if you're an investor and you're investing in a portfolio company, you want to put a clause in the stock purchase agreement which says that I as an investor can invest in competing products, competing companies, I don't have to give you the uh, corporate opportunities, basically I can do whatever I want. So it's important to put that disclosure if you're an investor. Let's go to a uh, similar hypothetical but a little different. Mike sits on the board of directors of Startup One and learns of an investment opportunity in a competitor, Startup Two. What if he also sits on the board of an investment fund looking for that kind of opportunity? What does he need to watch out for there, Alex? 
Well, this is another example that comes up often in these sorts of lawsuits, right? Here, it's a damned if you do and damned if you don't situation. Um, Mike has an obligation uh, to the fund, an obligation of loyalty to tell them about this investment opportunity. He also has an obligation to his startup not to tell the fund, right? So here you have a conflict between competing duties to multiple principles. Now let's go to the third and final uh, fiduciary duty that we want to talk about today, the duty of disclosure. You touched on it a little bit uh, in the duty of, of loyalty. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. So the duty of disclosure again, and it is sort of, you can think of it as one of the key duties because it comes up again and again also in the context of the other duties. It's the duty to disclose all material relevant facts to your principal. And it, again, it becomes particularly important crucially important if you're even thinking about entering into a self-interested transaction. That's when the duty of disclosure really becomes core. Now, can you actually, if you're litigating with uh, your principal, do you still have potential fiduciary duties? Is that even possible? Well, this is an excellent question because the answer often surprises people, particularly foreign investors who are not as familiar with U.S. fiduciary laws. Um, a number of courts have held that even if your relationship has already broken down, you've already each hired lawyers, you're not even talking to each other anymore. As a fiduciary, you may still have a legal obligation to disclose material facts to your principal, even if you've already become adverse. So, uh, just another comment. So, if you're an investor, oftentimes an investor serves on the board of directors of the company. If things are starting going downhill, if you think the company screwed you over, uh, and you're thinking, man, we might sue the damn company, you might want to resign from the board of directors. Because as long as you're a director of the company, your responsibility is not to the investor who appointed you, your responsibility is to the company. So oftentimes you say, see you later, I'm out of here. My job is to keep these guys on time. Let's go to landmine four. Uh, what are some, uh, uh, Lean Art, what are some common mistakes startups make in connection specifically with intellectual property? Okay, what's the most important asset a startup has? That's its intellectual property. What's the first and sometimes the only thing that investors look when they're doing due diligence of a startup? The intellectual property. So from day one, even before you, know, you incorporate your company, you got to make sure that you can show the next investor, you can show how the company got intellectual property. And what that means from a practical standpoint, anybody, anybody who does any development on your intellectual property has got to sign what is called a invention assignment agreement. Doesn't matter whether that person is you know, outsourced in Thailand or Kiev, doesn't matter you got to have him sign an agreement whereby he says, whatever I do for the company belongs to the company. If it's somebody, if it is somebody in the foreign country who doesn't speak English, you better make sure that the agreement is bilingual. Either Russian English, Ukrainian English, doesn't matter, but you got to be bilingual agreement. Landmine number five. Is it possible, Alex, that you could be responsible for another co-fiduciary duties action? What, 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 what's your experience there? Could you possibly be responsible for a co-fiduciary, uh, his actions? Uh, yes, absolutely, you can be responsible because ordinarily... What's a, good, what's a good example of that, Alex? Sure, well, you have a good example on the board, right? So let's say you sit on a board of directors and you're one of five and you're about to vote on uh, a transaction, a loan proposed by the CEO and you know one of the other directors has a secret interest in the lender. So it's your fiduciary obligation to A, disclose this to the other directors, and then if there hasn't been fully informed consent, it may be your fiduciary obligation to not just vote against that transaction, but to go to court and stop it. And I can give you a real life example from a case we litigated just a few years ago you had three co-trustees of a major half-billion dollar trust. And there was a transaction the trust entered, to, entered into that went bad. And two of the trustees voted for it, and the third one saw ahead of time it was a disaster, and he voted against it. And he thought that ended his responsibilities. And unfortunately, 
he was wrong because the beneficiary sued, and when it came to court, the court found it wasn't enough for that trustee to have voted against the transaction and try to talk his two co-trustees out of it. The court held the trustee had a fiduciary obligation to go to court and stop the transaction. And because he failed to do so, he was removed from his position. And all of these situations are very fact specific. Is that fair? That is absolutely fair. Okay, let's talk about uh, conflict between fiduciary duties to multiple uh, principles. Talk about that for a second, Alex, and how, how a uh, fiduciary can get in trouble. Sure, and that touches on what we discussed just a few minutes ago, right? That hypothetical where uh, Mike had a duty to the fund and to the startup. So that's an example of conflicting duties. And so the best way to avoid it is don't try to not get yourself in a situation where you are simultaneously working for representing two adverse principles or two potentially adverse principles. If you can't do that, then certainly try to obtain fully informed consents from both of them. And if you cannot do that, that touches on what Leonard said. You have to try to remove yourself from one or possibly even both of those representations. But here's what you absolutely should not do and cannot do, and I cannot stress this enough. You should never just ignore the conflict or try to hide the conflict. And again, I can give you a real life example from a case we litigated just a year ago. Um, we had a client that accused its fiduciary of breach of fiduciary duty. And the fiduciary happened to, quote unquote, accidentally lose two years of board minutes for a key time period in the case. And they blamed the secretary. They said, well, this was an ex accident. You know, we had no idea. Well, the court did not believe them, and it resulted in a $5 million sanction against them. So those, those types of issues can have very severe consequences. Let's go to landmine number six. Common mistakes that startups make in connection specifically with tax issues. Leonard, tell us about your experiences with that. Sure, before I jump to this one, quick comment. Um, if you're a startup and uh, you have a board of directors meeting, put as little as possible in the minutes. Don't, you don't need to put everything that was discussed, just main points. The more you put, the more it will open you up for you know, further investigation. So that's just a common, common standard in Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, so tax issues, tax issues. So you know how I first started talking about vesting? So when founder stock is subject to vesting, founders have 30 days, 30 days, to file what is called an 83B election. It's a one-page document you mail to the IRS. If you forget, forget to do that and the company goes up in price, the valuation rises, you're going to have a lot of tax problems. You're going to have to pay a ton of money for just forgetting to mail one page document within 30 days. And if you forget it, uh, there are ways of fixing it, but they are very difficult. So um, easy to remember, 30 days, file the damn paper. Alex, let's talk about uh, fiduciary duties after you may leave your position. Is it possible that you may run into trouble or have a claim against you for some action you take after you're no longer on the board, after you're uh, no longer in a position, a fiduciary position? Well, in an ideal world, once you left, you'd be done. But unfortunately, we do not live in such a world. And yes, it is absolutely possible that even after you leave your fiduciary position, um, you could still be subject to claims for breach of fiduciary duty and this often comes up in the context of when you're a founder, you have a startup, and some startups fail. And so are you then forever barred from pursuing the same idea elsewhere? Well, it's a gray area. And uh, one case that you may have heard of, right, Schroeder versus Pinterest, that came up. You had an individual who, before he advised Pinterest, advised another startup, Rendezvous which was alleged to have had the same idea. That idea just didn't work out. And so guess what? After the defendant, uh, Brian Cohn, left Rendezvous and started advising for and consulting Pinterest, and once that company became successful, his former partners and uh, co-founders of the prior failed startup turned up and sued him for breach of fiduciary duty, alleging that he had no right, even though that startup failed, to pursue the same idea elsewhere. And that case is still ongoing. What other contexts have you seen this post-fiduciary relationship come up? Non-competes? 
sure. confidential information? It comes up in both those contexts, right? And so non-competes, that generally depends what state you're in. In California, ordinarily, non-competes are not enforceable, right? Other states, like Illinois, they're somewhat more enforceable. But to be clear, Alex, what you see is claims where there's a non-compete or where they've done something while they were still there, the duty could, could uh, continue after employment, and they would tack on uh, potentially a fiduciary duty claim. Is that your experience? That is. That is exactly right. And another example that comes up very commonly is use of confidential information, right? So you're a founder, you're an investor, uh, you're somehow involved with the company, you leave, but while you were with the company, you obviously obtain some confidential information. And if you then try to use that information elsewhere, particularly with a competitor, you're most likely going to be looking at a lawsuit for breach of fiduciary duty. Landmine number eight. I don't need to worry about it because I'm just an investor. So, Leonard, can you protect yourself from breach of fiduciary duty claims by avoiding fiduciary positions in the company and making clear in the contract that you're not a fiduciary? Tell us about your thoughts on that. Not always, not always. Sometimes an investor can become a fiduciary. I'll give you an example. Oftentimes investors, especially seed or series A investors, they get veto rights. So the company cannot take an action without the approval of the investor. I had a couple of cases. The investor got pissed off at the founders. Personal reasons doesn't matter. And the investor said, oh, you know what? I'm going to exercise my veto powers, and I'm not going to approve any deal over $25,000. And you know what? The company couldn't function, and basically the company went under. And the company, then I filed a lawsuit on behalf of the company against the investor. I said, you killed the company. And we settled the case for, you know, close to seven figures. Let me add something to that real quickly. Um, another issue that come up, even if you never become a fiduciary, is an investor can still get dragged into a lawsuit. That happened with the Snapchat case. So there, right, the investors had nothing to do with it. They just invested. But one of the three co-founders who got kicked out early on happened to sue the other two. And guess what? He also sued the investors. And why? He said, well, either you knew or you should have known that they stole my idea. And so that's something to consider when you're considering the investment. Consider doing your due diligence. Consider if there is another potential co-founder out there who may come after the existing founders. Landmine number nine, can disputes arise regarding the role of founder after the sale? And this is pretty interesting because we heard from Sammy, he made a remark about uh, how one, you know, once he sort of crossed the bridge and took on investors and then had to operate in a different environment. Uh, Alex, tell me about your experience about how common it is uh, once a founder potentially sells to a fund that disputes arise over how that company is going to be operated. Um, well, there are a number of issues that come up, right? One example is, you know, the founder is often orally promised that he'd still have an active role in the company. And then that doesn't happen. And then obviously that gives rise to dispute. Another example is the founder does still have a role with the company. Maybe he's on the board, but he tries to remain much more active than the new buyer and the new owner would like. Again, major cause for conflict. Um, another example, uh, drag along and tag along rights. Uh, when someone wants to sell the company against the wishes of the former founder who is now the minority shareholder, gives rise to a lot of litigation. And all of those issues, by the, well, by the way, can be handled, potentially handled in advance through careful drafting of the documents. Leonard, we're running out of time, but thankfully we're at Landmine 10. Um, talk for a minute about once you are on the precipice of litigation or arbitration, once it's sort of changed into that environment, talk to us a little bit about uh, arbitration versus courts, uh, venue forum clauses, and choice of law. Tell us about some experiences there. Okay, so uh, rule of thumb, if you're an investor, you probably have a lot more money than the portfolio company. So you wanted to make it as expensive for the founders to litigate against you. So you want to find the most expensive, the most inconvenient forum. For instance, the, a lot of arbitration in the UK, uh, London Court of Arbitration, very, very common, incredibly expensive. Founders cannot afford it. If you're the founder, if you're the founder, you wanted to make it as cheap as you can. 
because that's the only way you can fight against a big pocket investor. So you want to probably do it in a state court in California where you can find an expensive lawyer and uh, really compete with the big pockets of the investor. Leonard, talk for a minute. We're running out of time, but just for a second, talk about in, in, in high altitude terms arbitration versus court. Any quick thoughts on that? Yeah, arbitration is basically you hire a private judge. It's usually a retired judge who you're going to pay money, a lot of money, six, seven, eight hundred dollars an hour. Is it always solve. cheaper? It's not always cheaper. Sometimes litigation can be, sometimes could be more expensive than litigation, even um, though litigation some, usually takes longer time. But in litigation, unless you're bribing the judge, you don't pay the judge. In arbitrators gets, get paid a lot of money. Let me just add something. Um, another issue that you should think about in advance is choice of law, because that can matter a lot. Depending on which law applies, you may have certain obligations, or you may not. You may have fiduciary duties, or you may not, for example, if you pick a foreign law, like Russian law. Um, so that's something to really carefully consider well ahead of time as you're entering into these agreements. That's helpful. We've only been able to scratch the surface, really, with these uh, 10 landmines. What we hope is that it's at least prompted you to think about some of the issues that you may face in whatever capacity you have, whether it's a buyer, a seller, shareholder, investor, uh, equity fund, whatever that is, that you stop and think about that as early on as the in the transaction uh, is possible. I'm telling you that it's a minefield, but it's a minefield that's navigable. Um, and we thank you for your time. We're, we think this has been an incredible conference, and we are all available uh, outside uh, after this to, to visit with you. Thanks so much. Thank you.